welcome you to River's online worship experience. We are delighted you decided to join us today. We realize that there are others just like us, and we are glad that you have made this a part of your day. We want you to wake up and tell your whole family that we're live. Second, we want you to share the broadcast. Right now, begin to share. Third, we want you to interact with us. The new amen in the virtual world is thumbs and hearts. We believe you will enjoy the worship and the word. If you miss us today at 8.30 a.m., tune in again at 10.30. We now have two services. Kingdom blessings and now receive uh, from the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, rivers. Give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we're here. And we're here in the presence of the Lord. And we've come to give you glory.
Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. Uh, we thank you for your mercy, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, uh, for another opportunity to come into your house. Uh, Father, we thank you, oh God, uh, Lord, for you decreed, uh, Lord God, uh, Lord, that better is the day in your house, uh, Lord God, than a thousand elsewhere. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord God, uh, and this is the day that the Lord has made, uh, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, and so, Father, we bless you in this place. Uh, we thank you, oh God, uh, Lord, that this is the epicenter of glory, Lord God, uh, and you pour out your glory and your power, Lord God, uh, even as we become a people, Lord God, uh, of compliance, Lord God, uh, with your word. Uh, in the name of Jesus, you decree even according to uh, John 8, 31, uh, through 32, Lord God, uh, if you continue in my word, uh, then you are my disciples indeed, uh, and you shall know the truth, uh, and the truth shall make you free. Uh, Father, we thank you, oh God, uh, even for freedom, Lord God, uh, being loose, Lord God, uh, in the atmosphere, Lord God, uh, of this place. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, oh God, uh, for a greater level, Lord God, of liberty, now being released uh, upon this mighty congregation. We thank you, oh God, uh, that even, Lord God, as we rise up uh, and pray in this place, Lord God, uh, that comes a new grace uh, upon this house, Lord God. Uh, Lord God, for continuance uh, and compliance uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, and Lord, we break uh, every assignment, Lord God, of anti-compliance. Uh, Lord, that we're trying to manifest uh, in this house uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, anti-compliance, Lord God, uh, that will align us uh, with the prince uh, of the power of the air, the spirit that works uh, in the children of disobedience. Uh, we break the power of every spirit of disobedience, Lord God, uh, that will run rapid uh, in this house uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we decree uh, we are a people uh, of obedience, oh God. Uh, we are a people uh, of compliance uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, oh God, uh, let the heavens be open, Lord God, uh, as we come, uh, Lord God, into divine uh, alignment, Lord God, uh, with you, uh, the living word. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, we command uh, let the heavens be open in this place. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, oh God, uh, let your angels, Lord God, that will feel, Lord God, the atmosphere in this place, Lord God. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, Lord God, uh, let the heavens be planted, oh God, uh, in this place. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we decree it, uh, a strong manifestation of heaven, Lord God, uh, on the preaching of the word. Uh, in the name of Jesus, let us stronger, Lord God, anointed uh, come uh, upon apostle Stephen and Connor, oh God, uh, the preacher, uh, like a man from another dimension. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, let us strong anointing, uh, let it come uh, upon the praise and worship team. Uh, oh God, uh, the usher of soul, God, uh, into your presence. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we decree it, oh God, the presence of the Lord falling in this place, Lord God, as we come into our life, Lord God, as we deal with the enemies of compliance, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we break all habits, oh God, as we break, Lord God, all punishments, all cycles, Lord God, of disobedience that will arise in certain seasons, oh God, in the name of Jesus, we decree, oh God, a new realm of maturity comes uh, upon this house uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, oh God, uh, we decree it. Oh God, we rise uh, to a new place of stature uh, in the name of Jesus. You decreed uh, in the corner of Luke uh, 2 and 52 uh, that Jesus increased uh, in the wisdom of uh, his stature uh, and in favor. Oh God, we increase uh, in the wisdom. Oh God, uh, as we align uh, with compliance uh, with your word uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, we increase. Oh God, uh, with stature. Oh God, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, Upon every son, every daughter, of every was a living one upon every family represented in the name of Jesus. We decree it, oh God, oh, that supernatural favor, let it be loose upon this house, Lord God, as we partner with you, oh God, in a place of compliance with your word. In the name of Jesus, we decree it, oh God, the favor of the king coming upon this house. In the name of Jesus, so us being up and oh God, they cannot be judged. See the wealth and riches, Lord God, coming in this house. We prophesy in the name of Jesus. Now, come on, people of God, if you believe in it, come on, give God praise for favor being released as we come into a new realm of compliance in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.
no more shackles holding you. You are free, you are free, you are free. You are free, you are free, you are free. You are free, you are free, you are free. No more shackles holding you. You are free, you are free, you are free. You say that you are free, you are free from your soul. You are free, you are free. Oh, you are free. You're not chained anymore. Father, we believe again this morning that we are free. For it is written, whosoever the Son sets free is free indeed. And so we thank you upon these tabernacles that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That freedom manifests for us. Freedom from within and freedom from without. The things that would bind us from within, we are loose from. And the things that would hold us down from without, we're free from. And so it's under you we lift our hands and we pay honor to. We bless this God who declare that where his spirit is, there is liberty. And so, Father, we bless you for that this morning. Come on, just take a few moments right there and just begin to worship him. Come on, lift your voices, people. Those of you whose voices have been released, come on, just begin to sing a song of liberty and freedom for a few moments. Come on, begin to sing over your own life. Sing over your mind. Sing over your marriage. Sing over your business. Come on, begin to sing a song of freedom and liberty. Come on, begin to prophesy in song that your business is free. Your marriage is free. Your mind is free. Come on, whoever the sun is set free is free indeed. And so we prophesy in song this morning that we are free, oh God. We are free indeed. We are free today. Come on. Yes, come on for a few moments. Yes, freedom. we're free, oh God. Come on, people, lift your voices for a few moments. Yes. The call of God upon my life is liberated by the Spirit of God. My gifts are released. I'm free again. Come on, begin to sing that chorus. Free again, free again. Come on. Free again, free again. Yes, come on. Free again, free again. Come on, the anointing is on me. Free again, free again. Come on, we're not bound by a season. We're not bound by a dictates of devils. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Well, let's put our hands together and bless the Lord. Welcome to our online audience. Thank you so much for joining us on this blessed day. Um, got a great word in store for you uh, and to our live audience as well. I welcome all of you to our 8.30 uh, a.m. service. And uh, we're just excited about what the Lord is doing for us here and uh, all the goodness uh, that is being released by way of Jesus. We've been in an exciting series um, since the beginning of July, uh, dealing with Christ as the ultimate disciple maker, or in the context of discipleship. And God has been giving us some tremendous insight, and one of the aims of this um, phase of teaching is to bring our local community uh, back into a divine awareness of the importance of discipleship with the goal of day-to-day -day application of the things that God is sharing with us. Uh, that leads to the making of a formidable people. And to our online audience, I trust that you have been taking some great notes. And uh, then we launched into a time of teaching uh, recently dealing with some of the enemies of discipleship. And we've been hammering uh, this primal enemy known as pride. So over the next few weeks, we're going to highlight uh, several more enemies. Uh, today will culminate um, identifying some of the characteristics of the assignment of pride against the development of the believer as a disciple of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was sharing concerning the Great Commission, the charge was to go into all the earth and to make disciples. We've been very good at making people other things, but somewhat subpar at making them disciples. And our working definition for a disciple is simply one who has become uh, um, uh, one who has become unified with their instructor in doctrine and in deed. The doctrine is what positions us to become before we're empowered to do. And if you look at the earthly ministry of Jesus, these guys that walked with him for about 3.5 years or so, uh, they were with him and Jesus demonstrated before them who in fact he wanted them to become. And so they had an eyewitness account of his life and they became astute followers of him and then a time came in his ministry where he charged them and he declared unto them I'm giving you power and authority uh, and I want you to go and I want you to heal the sick cast out devils I want you to preach the kingdom so it was out of them being with him that they were empowered to do for him and so that is one of the uh, primary goals of this phase of teaching uh, we're going to jump into this this morning uh, and deal with uh, some more aspects of um this, this the, the demonic assignment known as pride, the primal enemy of the disciple. And then I want to highlight uh, one specific hard saying that Jesus had in reference to pride. And then we'll look at some manifestations of pride and we'll bring this teaching to a close. Does that sound like a plan? All right, well, let's go to our foundational verses. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It reads, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. One of the things I've learned in teaching, um, in ministry in particular, is that when there's a void of repetition, sometimes there's also a lapse of continuity in both comprehension and then application. And sometimes things need to be said over and over. So there's a powerful principle in the scripture that declares faith cometh. That means there's continuity. And how does faith come it? It come it by hearing. It's twofold. The physical part of our lives connected to uh, the audible, the, the, the hearing side of us uh, is, is, is means that we can receive the information in language form. But after we get it in language form, then the continuity is in application. Language form and then application. People can be tricked through a process of an academic cycle and fail even though they were there physically present. Because something perhaps may have disrupted how they heard and also interfered with how they applied what they actually heard. And so life is about understanding principles for the believer that come from the mind of God to us by way of teaching or faith-inspired teaching. Let me say it that way. The hearing part and then the doing part. The hearing part is consistent with being. Be ye holy. I heard that. Let me be holy. Now there's a, dem there's a demonstrative part of being holy as well. Are you listening to me? And we want to make sure that as faith come it, faith come it, that we're also hearing. One aspect of hearing in both the Old and New Testament, taken from both the Hebrew and Greek, correlate with this interesting word called obey. 
So that means that faith cometh by obedience, and obedience has its origin in God's word. So Jesus tells us if you continue in my word, it cometh. It cometh. It is your source for obedience. And if you obey me, then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So let's look at this in the Amplified Version. So Jesus was saying to the Jews who believed on who believed him, if you abide in my word, continually obeying my teaching and living in accordance with them, then are ye my then are ye truly my disciples. Verse 32. You shall know the truth regarding salvation, which means that now I know that with salvation comes responsibility. And if I violate the tenets of this 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 plan of salvation there are also repercussions connected to it and he highlights this and the truth will set you free from the penalty of sin because if i'm out of god's will concerning salvation primarily i'm probably into some kind of it's almost like a foreign word you say it the saints will stone you you mention the word sin saints will go crazy i'm taking my membership out of here and i'm going to join another church you're always judging people always criticizing people always talking about people always say it was sin it is in the bible i felt that pressure even with sharing certain things and and it's like devil loose me you ain't finna bind me up and have me in bondage so continue, threefold perspective in reference to a place, in reference to time, in reference to a state or condition. Look at the current tenure of humanity. People have abdicated being in specific places that God has called them to in reference to time where it correlates with uh, to not perish, to last, to endure. We have found out that sometimes uh, uh, through this season that humanity has been reeling in the aftermath and the continual effects of is that some people don't have endurance in them. We've discovered we don't have endurance in us, that intrinsic capacity to last. And then in reference to a state or condition, and it literally means to, 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 to become another or different. So when there's continuity in the word, I don't have to be schizophrenic and unstable. I'm the same whether I'm going through a living hell. I'm the same whether I'm going through a living nightmare. I'm the same whether I'm in leanness. I'm the same whether I'm in abundance. We got too many wishy-washy, unstable and, 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 and non-resilient believers that at the slightest offense, misunderstanding, at the slightest mental dilemma, personal issues and indiscretions, uh, we become unstable. And God does not want that for us. And one of the ways we solve those deficits is by empowering people to become disciples of Jesus. The disciples that walked with Jesus, they went through a, a myriad of internal challenges. I mean, Jesus recruits these young, young guys, teenagers, uh, and tells them, let the dead bury the dead. And you, just, you just forsake everything and follow me. That's, who, who is ready for that kind of action? What, he, what Jesus was saying was, listen, nothing in this realm of time, the place you're currently at physically, or the conditions you were experiencing internally or externally uh, should disrupt your willingness to follow me if you really want discipleship. See, church membership does not warrant that. But a disciple has a responsibility to grab a cross every single day. Let me, let me take up my cross, but that don't, it don't stop right there. Deny myself and then follow him. That is the blueprint given by Jesus, and we have watered down what it means to really live a radical life for Christ, and now people use all kinds of, of things that are consistent with the darkness of this world to legitimize their human excuses uh, as to why they can't follow Jesus. One thing about Jesus is going to lead you into danger. You can believe that. He's going to lead you into times of getting your flesh offended. He's going to lead you into times where you're just going to have to drop everything and run for your life. Uh, he's going to lead you into times where you're going to be misunderstood on purpose. Because he's trying to offend something. I thought you said offense was an enemy. It is. But Jesus offends too. John the Baptist was on the brink of getting his head chopped off. Now, he had fulfilled all the glory of the scriptures. He was baptizing folk. He was calling them vipers. I mean, he was doing all kind of stuff. He baptized the Lord. But when Herod put his hands on him and put him in prison, uh, see, that's why you better, you, better, you better watch who dancing before you. You, better, you don't know what's behind that dance and who, uh, who entertained you. You better, you better watch yourself there, man of God. <laughs> 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 
And the moment he had to align his ministry with the ultimate minister, Christ, it was going to lead to death by way of beheading. He says, listen, brothers, I appreciate the commissary, but I got another problem going on. Go find that there Jesus. And ask him, look him in his eyes. And ask him, are you the one? Or should I be looking for another? another? See, the pressure that came with being conformed to his image, which was going to be transacted through death, John was like, look, this can't be all that God has for me. And a lot of times with born again believers, you say, well, I've lived right, I've done right. But then there's a way of death for us as well. And I'm talking about literal physical death. I'm talking about sometimes dying to appetites that are dangerous for you and those connected to you. Dying to relationships that if the relationship has somehow taken on the nature of dishonor, if it's facilitating works that are inconsistent with Christ, you can't say you in covenant with me and then you turn around and got a problem with a person that's in covenant with me. And then we, we can't and there's no evidence of reconciliation. It just doesn't work that way. It, 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 you know, it's, it's not it, you can't come into my house and take up an issue with me and then still want to be best friends with my children. It doesn't work that way. How in the world? Or do we come up with this stuff sometimes with God but, but for the sake of having status with people that appease our dysfunctions we suffer it to be so see real disciples where I'm challenging you to reconcile because if you won't reconcile with them God forbid what you'll do to me if there's ever an issue between you and I. And let's be honest, you can reconcile and then you can purpose simply to be cordial with people. Yeah, they may never have the access to what I call sacred space because of real violations that warrant you create a new boundary. But at the same time, we don't continue to conduct ourselves in a way that leads to a reproach to God. It's almost like if, if, if I'm relating, you, you got an issue with the worship team from the church that I'm joined to, you got an issue with me. Now, some folk don't feel that way. It's not an issue that we can't fix it if we're going to be civil. But don't come in my face acting like we cool, and then I know you've been dogging out my worship team. Because I'm not going to treat you different. I'm going to give you some distance. And it's in the distance where I don't have to hear the rhetoric connected to what's in your heart. And this is, this is, this is a big deal because I'm going to show you something here from this parable. In, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, Jesus is highlighting some powerful principles about growth. And he's given context for how we are to grow. Verse 24, and, a par and, and another parable put forth he unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And went his way, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. See, at the moment your life takes on the dimension of productivity, a tear comes up. Verse 27, so the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. And here's something powerful. Let them both grow together. Infinitely. No, nope. until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I would say to the reapers, gather ye together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this parable is, is connected to the kingdom and so Jesus is highlighting the field. The field represents the world, the terra firma, solid planet, the earth. And then there's a good guy. That's Christ. He sows good seed. Those are the people of the kingdom. And then while these people slept, an enemy came and sowed tares, the children of the wicked at night. The next day, the enemy is identified, and Jesus, in the interpretation of this parable, highlights him as Satan, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. They're both in the same realm, planted in the same soil. Jesus' solution was don't rip up the wheat while you're trying to rip up. Don't rip up the tares lest you tear up the root system of the wheat. Let them both grow together until harvest. Now, this is interesting because in society today, look at what this pandemic has done 
initially it shut down the economies of men. It shut down um, the, the, a lot of things. It shut down the educational process. It brought things to a screeching halt because there was a void of understanding concerning this specific strand known as COVID-19. The virus in itself is not new because fundamentally it's a flu. It just took on a different strand, a different nature, and then it activated all the conspiracy theories, especially in the church. Where people waste their time arguing and really on the inside of them, there's a bias that's connected to a political position they've taken because they don't understand the kingdom. What am I saying? In the context of being who God has ordained for us to be, we stop growing. But the world is still moving at warp speed, accelerating in realms of innovation and pioneering breakthrough technology and coming up with creative ways to enhance life and to move beyond a time. And then we got all the skeptics who are supposed to be spirit filled tongue talkers with the hook of Mashandas and the kickstart Mahayundes. And all they can do is use a social media platform to argue their ignorance. Because the question must be asked, saint of God, can you take that argument that you are so adamant about and reconcile it back to Christ? Why are you trying to call yourself an apostle or call yourself a prophet? Where is Jesus being promoted in that? And don't tell me uh, that it's the truth because you cannot take it uh, and you cannot align it with his word. Uh, and this is why when it comes down uh, to things that produce hyperbole in the realm of men, uh, we need to simply have a conviction working inside of us. I belong to him him and just because he spoke to me it doesn't mean it's for you I mean if God told you to spray yourself with Lysol don't make it a corporate prophecy now everybody got to spray themselves with Lysol that's just for you and your goofy self I mean God told you to use Listerine your breath been stinking why I got to be a pandemic that now you got a revelation about Listerine you should have been using it some of the erroneous stuff we come, where is that leading to making up disciples? Uh, and then when you bring intelligence into the equation, uh, when you bring pragmatism uh, into the equation, when you bring simple solutions into the equation, people get mad. Well, I know what God told me. He told, he told, I know what he told you too. He told you to shut up. You're in rebellion now. That's why you're in your flush. He said, grow together. Why are we so insist about what the world is doing? I mean, if, if, if you got all this power, then start sharing this power that you have and stop vexing me uh, with your verbal diarrhea. Uh, start, leave me alone with that stuff. And, it, and it's like I wrestle with that on the inside. I said, Lord, let me help me, Jesus. Let me help me to keep my focus. But he said, let them both grow together. And then you look up and you got the same honorary person in the next pandemic with a conspiracy. All right, you ain't grew, but the world is moving in warp speed. And then in the church, we start developing an appetite for carnality because we have dumbed down spirituality because the moment our society, world, and generation needs us to be conduits of power, we're bankrupt because we have not continued in the word and what we've allowed uh, is the time and seasons of men, uh, our personal conditions and the place we're in to affect us uh, from honoring God's word. Listen, the entrance of his word brings light. It gives an understanding. Uh, I know uh, a lot of the stuff in my flesh I want to do, the word break in and tell me nope you, you, you're about to violate uh, protocols uh, you're about to get in pride uh, you're about to get in rebellion uh, don't you get involved in it and it's difficult it's difficult so there are things we got to be willing to grow with but they, they, here's, the, here's the caveat you grow with it but it's forbidden to, for growing in you and so the enemy that sold the tares among the wheat it is said from an agricultural perspective that tares carry the capacity to poison a harvest. And at the time of harvest, wheat becomes golden and bows, but the tear becomes blackened and erect. And it is a picture of how the enemy operates, especially when pride is factored into the equation. But Jesus says, let them both grow together. We need to be working on innovative ways uh, to sustain our families. We need to come up with sustainables from a financial perspective. God, where should we be investing? Uh, what stock should we invest in? Uh, while you are a prophet and you hear from God, why don't you start sharing some stock tips uh, since you got all this other stuff or tapping into some ways we can make some money? <laughs> I don't get it. 
So y'all pray for me. I'm trying to stay sanctified. Let me give you a couple of hurdles to growing properly. Number one, a lack of a, a lack of a sustainable plan to grow according to what's warranted or in accordance to one's goals. You can have a grandiose idea about life. I was conversa conversating with one of my sons, and I, I shared with him just a, some manhood stuff and some of the things that drive my value system. Like, as a youngster, I knew nothing about the stock market. I, not, I knew nothing about the 52-week highs and lows, about a prospectus. I knew nothing about IPOs. I, I didn't know how to read that stuff. And it was just dealing with guys who were older than me that had investments going, and I would strike up conversations because I need to know what you know. I was a hustler anyway, so I just got to do it the right way. Now, I can't, I can't rob you and catch you when we, you know, on lunch break and hit you in your head and go in your pocket. So I may as well get in your mind and get some insight from you. I'm saved. And they would share wisdom and insight. And then I started some simple, you know, investments and stuff within my intellectual parameters as well and things I could comprehend and then apply to my personal financial portfolio. And it was a struggle because... At the same time, I'm getting this information and intel. I got something working against me, an enemy called poverty, called hand to mouth. Are you listening to me? Called pocket to merchant. <laughs> and it was challenging. Set up some stuff through, you know, some IRAs. You got investments through your job. Get you some life insurance. Put some addendums to that. Work on a wheel, get your trust for your key, all this stuff that requires money to make money. Are you listening to me? The older you get, you're going to have to shift it to some annuities and you got these different things going. And so you know, it, 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 all of this stuff while being spirit filled, speaking in tongues, trying to live righteous and holy, but having a sustainable plan to grow financially. To grow my family, even though materialistic wise, you may not have what you want. But you're working on the future for the people that are going to come behind you to make their transitions a little bit easier. Are you listening to me? It's important. I just did some more in personal investments to beef some stuff up because I got a grandbaby coming now. So now the plan needs an addendum. And it's got to grow. Are y'all listening to me? And, and that goes to the grandbaby. Oh, yeah. Got to have a strategy. And it costs money every month, but it's grown. Mm. What sustainable plan do you have consistent with your goals, consistent with your desired growth trajectory that's going to get you from point A to point B? See, real disciples understand the power of continuity. If I see something in Jesus that I desire and I know it's a part of my responsibility, what is my plan to grow in him to get to that point? In the local church, if you can't take the information that's shared and it becomes practical to you, then you're religious in Stephen's estimation. You just want a good sermon. You don't want to be equipped for life. The stuff we share, like grow, let them both grow together. Some of y'all work in environments that are hostile, period. Ain't got nothing to do with you saved. They don't even know you saved. They don't know you saved. They don't need to know you saved. It's hostile towards your career, towards your intellectualism, towards your education, all the stuff you've studied, maybe towards your gender, maybe towards your ethnicity, and you got to deal with hostility. Jesus said, let them both grow together. Now we got to look at him as the perfect pattern. How do I grow in the midst of adversity and opposition? You better get you a plan. Don't abandon the place because your blessing is there. Don't let this current season of agitation in your soul make you uproot yourself and miss a moment mm. don't allow the current condition in your stage of growth to make you become arrested in your development because you can't see past the demonized person that's blocking your promotion I thought you were seated in a heavenly place in Christ I thought you were above all principality and power. see the problem is maybe you ain't in him well, Jesus, how do I get in you so I can ascend? The Bible says in Proverbs 15 that the way, of the, uh, uh, the, the way of life of the wise is above, that his soul might depart from hell beneath. So maybe wisdom is missing. So make it the principal thing. If you lack it, ask God. He'll give it to you, and he won't withhold it. 
This is this. so practical application of stuff you hear. Here's another one. Flawed metrics for growth combined with poor examples. This is my measuring system for what growth should look like, but the examples I have are horrible. Who's your example for marriage? Who's your example for fathering or mothering? Who is your example for being a man or a woman? Who is your example for financial acumen and savvy? Who is your example for being righteous and pure and holy? What relationships have you built to help strengthen you in that area? Sometimes our metrics is jacked up because if you look at what's trending and you use social media platforms as a metric system for growth, you have some problems. Even though I like the new trend they got. About the best I can do. <laughs> Misconstrued or weak personal value systems for personal growth. What is your personal plan to be developed? There are different stages even of developing leaders. There's a powerful book written by... Uh, Oren Woodward and Chris Brady is called Launching a Leadership Revolution, um, Mastering the Five Levels of Influence. And the first one they have is learning. Every functional believer who's going to grow in grace and grow in Christ, you must marry the mandate to learn. Nobody knows it all. Nobody. Nobody knows it all. Because one of the challenges even in education is that people can get information and be horrible at application. So you can be extremely smart and you look at folks like, man, you got a PhD and you still that shallow. And sometimes it's language barriers. I hear what I hear, but I can't communicate what I've heard in a way to make it simple where it works for me. I can pass a test. And unfortunately, people like that get empowered. That is why the hand of God is now orchestrating an upheaval. And a lot of the economies of men, because he's going to balance the equation, it has to happen. It's, you're going to see it, too. You're gonna start, it's going to be some more financial and economic instability, not because uh, it's just bad times. It's because God is intervening. There are some real saved people uh, who are really living right and praying and purposing to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And they're growing. And they ain't famous. They don't have an appetite for fame. They just simply want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You don't know that some of the most influential people, even in society today, are the least visible? Because the more you grow, the least you should be seen. The stronger you become in whatever it is God has called you to do, your visibility should diminish as well. That's why Jesus makes it clear, I must go away. You got me for a season. I'm here. I can't be around because you won't grow. Fixed mindsets void of capacity or willingness to make sound judgments is another challenge for growth. It's a hurdle for growing properly. Now, Jesus has a hard saying. Let me wrap this up in the next couple of minutes or so. In Luke chapter 18, this is a powerful parable that highlights the danger of pride. And in, I'm going to read this from the Amplified Version. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous posing outwardly as upright and in right standing with God and who viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And I shared last week that tax collectors were disdained during this historical time because Israel was under Roman occupation and the taxes that were being collected were being rendered to Caesar. And so when Jews got involved in tax collecting, their own people hated them and despised them. And so here now, we the same blood, same nation, and you despise me because of my occupation. Listen, listen to this clearly. And it goes on, it says... The Pharisee stood ostentatiously and began praying to himself in a self-righteous way, saying, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unjust, dishonest, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his eyes toward heaven, but was striking his chest in humility and repentance, saying, God, be merciful and gracious to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you, this is Jesus, that this man went to his home justified, 
forgiven of guilt and sin and placed in right standing with God rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself, forsaking a self-righteous pride, will be exalted. I really like the way this comes out because there's a principle here even connected to salvation. When Jesus makes the scathing indictment by way of a statement in Matthew chapter 7, and he says, and many are going to come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, they understand that he, he's master, right? They got a revelation. Did not we, but they got a works mentality. Prophesy in your name. Cast out devils in your name. And do many wondrous works in thy name. And Jesus says, and I'm going to say unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. They focus an emphasis on what they could do for him, who they were, versus just being with them. And so this is a picture of justification. One who justifies himself and the other who pours himself out to be justified by God. See, pride will always have us to take a self-righteous position. It's an enemy of real discipleship, and it is one of the primal enemies of making disciples because people have a sense of really feeling like they value and mean something to you based on what they could do. You know, it's like in the natural, my children don't have to earn my affection. I mean, they're my kids. And whether they mess up or do what I ask them to do or not, I have a responsibility. I'm bound by duty and obligation to God to take care of them. Are y'all listening to me? In church, why is it that we have a merit system that's really governed by control? And we put things on display intentionally to get people to buy into a system that's governed by darkness. And this is what you get, a perpetuation of self-righteousness. Of self-justification. Jesus said this guy prayed to himself. You know why? Because he wasn't hearing them prayers. <laughs> he was fasting. He was tithing. All the stuff that will make you a good member. But a horrible disciple. Because our righteousness, let's be honest, is just filthy rags. And many people boast of their, in their life believers, allegedly. And they base their legitimacy in God on what they have and not who they are. I got to wind this up. Got to wind this up. I'm going to give you some characteristics of the prideful, and then we're going to highlight maybe about three or four passages, and then we'll pray, and we're going to receive communion. So here are some characteristics of the prideful. They are adamant about things going their way, or it won't happen at all. You ever, ever work with anybody that their way was the only way, and if it didn't go their way, they're going to shut the whole thing down? We trumping everything. Here's another one. They can't handle criticism or correction of any sort, but are highly skillful at dishing both of them out. Now, see, for you tell on yourself, these right here, you need to be Jesus, help me. That needs to be the response because that way we won't know that we, I'm actually talking about you. And I've been all these points, so I can say that emphatically. Number three. They don't listen very well and formulate what they're going to say while others are speaking. I think they call that clapback nowadays, right? These little shallow people. Clap back. It's like, shut up. <laughs> Number four, they are unteachable. They know it all. They are superior. They can't learn anything. There's a cartoon when I was a kid called Commander McBride. Commander McBride had this corn pipe in his mouth and wore a safari suit. Uh, the shorts and the, with, the, with the hat on his head, and uh, he would spin the globe, and he had a tail about everywhere, wrestling crocodiles and lions and bears. But the only problem is, as the narratives played out, he was getting beat up by the lions and the bears and all that. But his perspective was he was, he was just conquering the jungle. <laughs> said, uh, but you, you, the pride will make folk unteachable. They know everything. They're superior. They can't learn anything. You start, yeah, I, I know about that already. I, I, I got that part already. We did that years ago. Everything you share that may be fresh and relevant for you, they, it's old news to them. They are, I, yeah, we did, yeah, we did it already. <laughs> Number five, they are sarcastic and often say things designed to injure others intentionally. Their rebuttal is just, their rebuttal is, this is just the way I am. You hurt me. Well, you know, I can't apologize for who I am. That's just how I get down. And last one, they want to be praised 
or to be coaxed to serve. They are unwilling to initiate or commit to the right thing while knowing it will please God. Well, man of God, we need your assistance. You know, over the next couple of weeks, can you commit to being here? Well, brother, uh, is the pastor going to be there? Okay, I'll be, I'll be there. Then he get there. No work is done because he just wanted to get to the pastor. <laughs> Proverbs 11, 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. In the Revised Standard Version, it reads this way. When pride cometh, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. Going back to the parable, Jesus tells us when the, the tares represent the seed or the children of the, of the wicked one, but we got to grow with it. Unfortunately, being in the world system, a lot of believers prior to salvation have this stuff in them. And there's a need for it to be rooted out of us while we're going through developmental stages of growth and remaining firm in the things of God. This is where the visible ministry and the public ministry of Jesus called deliverance is so formidable to the development of disciples. Not that we, it's a panacea, but it's a part of it. It's a vital part of it because it's, comp it's a component of salvation. The Taylor translation reads this way. Proud men end in shame, but the meek become wise. So shame, disgrace, embarrassment, and dishonor are all roots of pride that operate inside. And that's where we need to get the stuff out of us so we can be effective in growing with that stuff around us. Mm. When dealing with pride, it's necessary to take time to renounce because pride likes to hide. And so a principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, Therefore, having received this ministry, we faint not, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We don't walk in craftiness. We don't handle God's word deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That is, the, that, that is a powerful dimension of humility. And let me give you this one. Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride come in contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Arguing and quarreling are manifestations of pride. The Young's literal translation reads this way. A vain man through pride calls it debate. <laughs> Vanity. I look at you, I'm better than you, let me, let me kick it off. The demon of pride feels debate and strife. Many bound by pride lack wisdom and are often entangled in controversy. Let me read that again. The demon of pride feels debate and strife. Many bound by pride lack wisdom and often, and often entangled in controversy. I don't want my name drugged through the mud, but if it is, so be it. Because at the end of the day, if there's any truth to it being drugged through the mud, let me humble myself to get liberated. But if there's if it's nothing there, then why give it any attention? But see, that thing called strife and arguing and debating, and it, well, you're you ready to kick it off, and you're ready. It's, it's the spirit of pride, and it will impede your personal growth from within. Psalm 31 verse 20. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. The demon of pride stirs strife and contention as well. Strife is at the root of every angry and bitter disagreement that normally leads to the breaking of covenant. The first reference to strife in the Bible is between an uncle and a nephew, an uncle whose name was Abram and his nephew's name was Lot. Now this uncle Abram go and rescues his nephew Lot, brings him into his realm of empowerment, of blessing, of increase. And all of a sudden, Abram wasn't trying to control him. Lot began to increase. And the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abram begin to quarrel. There was strife. And Abram tells his nephew, let there be no strife between me and you. You, 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 wherever you desire, you choose is yours. The humble approach, and what did Lot choose? Lot chose a territorial grid that was governed by perversity and iniquity. Hear me clearly. You see, there are systems that seduce men governed by pride, especially when strife is there. And these systems uh, will force us to take our precious seed and plant it into waste fields uh, that can't produce a harvest. Uh, and when you have times like this in humanity uh, where people really need the strength of the body of Christ, uh, not to be a political polarizing voice, uh, not to be some antagonistic voice, uh, but come, there's a healing anointing flowing here. And we don't have to boast and brag about it uh, because we've been in a realm in Jesus uh, where 
but he's put something on us. Uh, do you not know that we have seen miracles in this pandemic by the glory of God? We've seen breakthrough. Uh, there have been all kinds of manifestations of power and the goodness of God increase uh, because of practicing uh, principles and applying them. Even in times where the seasons of men in different lot chose Sodom. Got ensnared, got jacked up, took his wife out and opened him up to incest with his own daughters. And you think about because we never look and see things through. When strife comes in, it facilitates covenant breaking assignments. Let me help you to our online audience. There are some people in your life you cannot afford to not have them in your life. It takes humility to even say to another human being, you know, I need you in my life. I don't need nobody. Then they start cussing in single letters. <laughs> you know, they use three letters for a whole statement of profanity. When at the end of the day, you're just a broken human being. You need people. Hmm. Pride will often feel quarrels about preferences that have nothing to do with principles. Pride will at times drive individuals to become divisive and combative. The aim is to, is to keep them continually in chaos and confusion. Contention is another manifestation of pride. Proverbs 13.10 declares that only by pride comes contention. So notice what, what the psalmist says. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in the pavilion from the strife of tongues. So pride, the pride of man is a proponent for the strife of tongues, combative tongues, uh, covenant-destroying tongues, debating tongues, all this stuff. So here's some things you can look for. Profanity, profane speech. There are people that were arguing recently. There was something that took place with a celebrity gospel artist and some uh, 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 rants, I guess, with one of their children, and it went viral through certain social media outlets. And then, and, and, and then here, come, here come the pundits. Here come the pundits weighing in, sharing, you know, share, sharing their insight, and then folk justifying stuff you can't reconcile to Christ and alleging to be, here's the difference, a member, a church member, <laughs> But not a disciple, because can you see God going on a rant and hitting Jesus like that? What person out of love? There's nothing that my kids can do to get me to the point where I violate my relationship with Jesus like that. But I'm not knocking anyone else because sometimes on our best days, you can have weak moments and you can do stuff that you simply regret. Thank God for repentance. But I'm not going to justify it. I don't need anybody else justified. Now, if you use profanity, profane speech, we're cussing in the Bible, and, and you can't say that Peter cussed, and you can't say this and that. Listen, man, vulgarity is vulgarity. If, 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 if you are arrested in your development and you can't come up with a better form of linguistic capacity, then go somewhere and get taught how to communicate and take some anger management classes. And let's leave people alone. And stop bashing people because we don't know what the details are indeed. And you don't owe anybody an apology. It's, and if anything, you need to repent to God for offending him. But you ain't going to get no cussing out this preacher. I might throw one of these chairs at you, but I ain't going to cuss you out. <laughs> might still on you and you start talking crazy enough, but I ain't doing no cussing. <laughs> you better. <laughs> Father, help me. Proverbs 29, verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The Amplified Version reads this way. A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is of a humble spirit will obtain honor. Promotion, elevation, and advancement are often elusive to those bound by the demon of pride. And some may say, well, man, I beg to differ because this person is polarizing and that person is polarized. You have to realize that the God of this world gave them their goods. It's the difference. There's no way you can live a polarizing life and violate the basic tenets of Scripture and misrepresent Jesus and then God still pours all his blessing and goodness on you. No, because there's a, there's a compensating harvest for the seeds that we sow. Remember when Jesus was being tempted and the first thing the devil does is appeal to his appetite and Jesus responds with the word, Matthew chapter 4, right? 
that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him to a mountain and, 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 and sing one of them crisscross uh, rap songs to him. Crisscross and make you jump, jump. And Jesus and, and Jesus said, <laughs> he tried to tell him, he took the scripture in Psalm 91 and twisted it. And Jesus was like, no, bro, you know, thou should not tempt the Lord thy God. And then he says, I got one more for you. He took him to the pinnacle of a mountain. In a moment, all the glory and riches of the kingdoms of this world that are subject to perish. He says, if you give me your worship, surrender your bow to me, I give you all this stuff. And what we have subtly done, we have looked at materialism gained by ruthlessness and still somehow equated as being the blessing of God. But in a very sacred moment, people surrender their worship to the seducing voice of this evil genius known as the prince of the power of the air. And we celebrate materialistic gain, but intrinsically is an eternal erosion taking place. I don't want us to be a bankrupt people who don't know him from the inside out. I'm telling you, because God can do for you overnight what it can take you 10 years to do through your own capacity. It works that way. There are people who woke up billionaires today. They laid down millionaires yesterday and woke up billionaires today. There are people who are gaining materialism hand over fist, buying islands and all kind of stuff. And you, you can't, the earth belongs to God. You just have a project mentality where you feel like you got to be locked into a small place. Yeah, well, I can't say get your airline ticket to Spirit right now because they got problems. But, you know, try somebody else and just go somewhere. And see how other people live. And look at God's goodness. We need to do that. Sometimes our issue of success has a lot to do with our worldview. And we have a poor biblical worldview. Then you'll look at success the wrong way. Hmm. Last one. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, who glor whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. And then in verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot. Pride is a root cause for drunkenness and addictions. Pride fuels reckless and divisive behavior often demonstrated by those who struggle with addiction. If you've ever had to deal with an alcoholic or drug addict, if you've ever been one, you know that all the people that love you, that try to get you to get off the stuff and by God's grace, you broke free, but you know it was a struggle. And the more you, you abuse drugs and alcohol, the more chaotic and unstable your life became. And that is the stuff that a lot of people, even in the churches, so now we justify drinking in the house of God. See, a drink for you may just be a drink. But a drink for me may activate generational curses where there are demons that have been in that bloodline that have destroyed people. And this is why. Pride will drive us to partake of reckless behavior. And when a per the Bible says, give strong drink to him that's ready to perish. I don't interfere with what folk do in their home. That ain't my business. I don't take care of you. I don't live with you. Thank God. But you're not going to be able to take stuff and then front it before me publicly and tell me just to mind my own business. Man, go on over and call yourself a saint. Oh, you getting judged. You getting fire and brimstone prayed on you. I'm just kidding. You can't do that. Even though with some people, he's just like, Jesus, can you just hit him with one, one lightning, one, one lightning bolt? Just hit him with one. Just let it hit somewhere in the close proximity and, and let it just, you know, split the ground and, uh, or something, you know, and let it burn maybe the bottom of their feet just a little bit. <laughs> Jesus don't work like that. Through loving kindness, he draws us. Even though that sounds good. Come on, let's stand to our feet. <laughs> hallelujah. Come on, can you say Hallelujah. So, Father, we just bless you this morning for the word of grace that has come to both encourage and challenge us to be those disciples, a people who adhere to the standards that are wrought in your word from a place of love and, and just desire to know you. So help this local church and those that are tuning in by way of the live stream to become a lover of you and to place loving you above everything and to understand that that some of us are in situations that require we grow with indifference, with pain, loss, with hurt, but yet we're still mandated to grow. And so I thank you for just a clear and concise growth strategy 
that comes unto us by way of your word and your spirit. And at the appointed time, you will liberate us from the things that have been sown by the enemy to impede us from being that formidable disciple of Christ and being one with you in doctrine and in deed. Help us to overcome growth barriers and growth hurdles and to be a people who will not seek to justify ourselves, but a people who will seek to be justified by you as we humble and, and, and break ourselves before you. And I give you glory for a defeat that comes to this evil enemy called pride. Help us to be a people who walk circumspect before you and others, who practice humility, for it is written, before honor there is humility. And so over this blessed congregation of believers, we thank you, Lord, for an impartation that comes uh, for us to be a people who are humble, realizing the dangers associated with pride. We bless you for your faithfulness towards us. And Father, help us not to run from things that oppose who we are, but to deal with them with dignity. And Father, when we lack the capacity to have enough humility to ask a brother or a sister for help, and give it to us in Jesus' name. And I just bless you, Father, even for those who are tuned in that may not be born again. I ask that you would visit them and save them and that you would do something miraculous in the realm of salvation and that they would be put in a local assembly that will nurture them and feed them and grow them and develop them and empower them to be like Christ in Jesus' name. I give you glory for that. And I thank you, Father, for this house. I thank you, Lord, for enlarging us, increasing us, even in this season of indifference and where so many unknown variables are moving in the agendas of men. You know all things. You are sovereign and you work everything by the counsel of your own will. And you are above all things. You are before all things. And by you all things exist for your preeminent. And so be it unto us in this place the preeminence of the sovereign one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together and bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, to our online audience, I want to encourage you to continue to partner with us here, River Chicago, as we are in our We Build campaign. And every week we're encouraging partnership uh, for the members who are streaming online. Um, there's access for you to give uh, and, and, and sow into what we're doing in the various parts of just your commitment to the local church. We bid you God's peace and we'll see you again at 10.30 a.m. To our online audience, God bless. We love and appreciate you so much. More grace.